In this video, I want to talk about a very important theorem known as the Intermediate Value Theorem. Now, in a, in a math textbook, you often see numbers attached to theorems like this is theorem 2.5.17, which this number might be relevant for this lecture series because this is the 17th result inside of section 2.5 in our lecture series, which is about continuity, 2.5 is. But if I was to go ask someone like, oh, you remember theorem 2.5.17? No one's going to know what I'm talking about. And that's because if a theorem is really important enough to we want to talk about it, it, you know, outside of a classroom, out, you know, without reference to a textbook, we need to attach a name to it. And so when a theorem like the intermediate value theorem has a name attached to it, that means it's kind of a big deal. And as a student of calculus, you're going to want to know this theorem by name. You need to know the assumptions of the theorem. You need to know what the conclusions of the theorem are so you can use it correctly. So let's read what the theorem says and talk about what the interpretation should be. Suppose that a function f is continuous on some closed interval a to b. Closed interval is important here. And let n be any value that sits in between f of a and f of b, assuming f of a and f of b are not the same y-coordinate, otherwise there's nothing between them. And this is actually where it gets the name intermediate value theorem. Because if n is between f of a and f of b, then it's an intermediate value. Um, one rule of thumb I want to mention to you uh, when it comes to calculus, we often use the words value and number differently. In regular English, these are, these are considered synonyms, right? But in calculus, to help make the language a little bit more articulate, whenever we talk about a number, we're talking about an x-coordinate. That is, we're talking about something in the domain. On the other hand, if we ever talk about a value, we're talking about a y-coordinate. And so that's something we try to distinguish between. A value is a y-coordinate. Um, that is, it's something with respect to the indirect variable. A number is referring to an x-coordinate or something to do with the direct variable. And if I ever talk about a point, a point will always reference an order pair. We have an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate together. So when we have the intermediate value theorem, I want you to talk about it's the intermediate y-coordinate theorem. That's another way of thinking about it. And so getting back to it, if f is continuous on some closed interval a to b, and you have some intermediate value n between the y-coordinates f of a and f of b, then there exists a number. So there's guaranteed a number in the domain. That is, there's some number c that sits inside the interval a to b. This notation here just means that c is greater than a but less than b. So there's some number, there's some intermediate number between a and b that guarantees that f of c equals n. So to the right here on the screen, you see an illustration that's, that's well, illustrating the intermediate value theorem. If you have some function f, like you see right here, it's continuous, right? So there's no breaks, holes, or rips inside of our function here. If we pick specific numbers in the domain, so like x, or x equals a, x equals b, you're going to see there's these points right here on the graph. And so we look at the values f of a and f of b. If we were to pick any, any, any intermediate value between f of a and f of b, if we draw the line, eventually it'll intersect the graph somewhere. And then there's some coordinate in the domain somewhere between a and b that produce that value. So if we pick any inter intermediate value between f of a and f of b, there's guaranteed to be something in the domain something between a and b that'll produce that value. So this point right here is c comma f of c, where f of c is equal to n. And so let me show you some applications. Well, one in particular of the intermediate value theorem. We are gonna use the intermediate value theorem to show that there is a root to the equation 4x cubed minus 6x squared plus 3x minus two equals zero. Now, I deliberately chose this polynomial because this is one you're going to have a hard time factoring if you sort of do it using techniques you might have learned in a pre-calculus setting. We're going to show that there's actually a root to this polynomial. There's a solution to the equation between the numbers 1 and 2. So the first thing to do is you have to first mention what is the function in play here? What is f of x? And so I'm going to take f of x to be the left-hand side of this equation right here. Uh, 4x cubed minus 6x squared plus 3x minus 2. Notice that this function is a polynomial function. Therefore, it is continuous on its domain, which is all real numbers. So f of x is continuous everywhere. So that's the first part. Whenever you do a proof like this, you always need to verify the assumptions 
of the intermediate value theorem. Because if you take a function that's not continuous, then the result is not guaranteed. Like if we take a function which has some type of jump discontinuity, like so, so here's our function f, and then we pick values like, okay, uh, whoops, here is my f of a, we'll pick this right here to be like my f of b, and then let's choose my intermediate value to be this one right here. This is my n. Is there some place on the graph of f that intersects this line n? No, there's not because there's a big stinking hole inside the function. It's kind of like if I throw a rock at your house, right? You know, it's like people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Well, they can if the window's open. If you throw the rock, it just goes through the window. There's a hole in the wall. It doesn't break anything. No big deal. So continuity is important. So it is important to declare in your, in your argument here that F is continuous, because if F was discontinuous, the intermediate value theorem doesn't apply here. So once we've, once we've identified that the function's continuous, because again, the types of the ones we'll do will be like polynomials or trigonometric functions, things that'll be obviously continuous based upon what we've already talked about in this lecture and the previous lecture. The next thing to do is then to verify that I'm gonna get rid of this picture right here. We then need to verify that there's some place where the function is below the x-axis and somewhere where it's above it, all right? So th think of this in my, our, think of this as our picture here. So we're gonna take the x-axis right here, compute the function f of one, okay? Well, f of one, just by regular calculation, right? You're gonna take four times one cubed minus six times one squared plus three times one minus two. Um, simplifying that, of course, all powers of one are themselves just one. So you end up with four minus six plus three minus two. That equals negative one. Negative one, notice, is a negative number. So what we're saying here, if you take the value x equals one, we're going to do x equals two in a moment. If you take the value x equals one, we're going to get a point something like this. At x equals one, um, the y-coordinate turned out to be negative one. What about at f of two? If we were to do f of two, well, again, just evaluate the function. You're going to get four times two cubed uh, minus six times two squared plus three times two minus two, like so. Two cubed uh, is equal to eight times five, four is 32. Two squared is four times six is 24. Three times two is six and minus two. And so when you combine those together, 32 minus 24 plus six minus two, that adds up to be 12, which is positive. And so you're going to get something like this. Do not worry if it's drawn to scale. Because the middle, there's no x, there's no y coordinate, no y axis for it to be drawn to scale at all. Anyways, there's no scale. But if you take the point two comma twelve, you see that there's a point below the x axis, and you have a point that's above the x axis. Because the function's continuous, there must be somewhere. The only way we can get from point A to point B is somewhere we have to cross this line. There's got to be an x-intercept between x equals 1 and x equals 2. And so that's how the intermediate value theorem applies. The intermediate value theorem using the intermediate value 0, you'll notice 0 is between negative 1 and 12. Because the function is continuous, the function is somewhere negative and somewhere positive, there must be an x-intercept somewhere between 1 and 2. So we can guarantee the solution to this equation by the intermediate value theorem, even though we don't actually know what the solution is. Now, the intermediate value theorem does actually provide a technique for which we can approximate the solution. We know there's a solution between 1 and 2. Well, what if we got a little bit closer? Notice that f of 1.2 is negative 0.128. That's negative. Uh, if you take f of 1.3, that's 0.548. That's positive. And therefore, we can even do better, not just... You know, we knew there was a solution between 1 and 2, but now we actually know there's a solution between 1.2 and 1.3. Um, we can also do better, right? If we take f of 1.22, that's going to be negative 0 0.007008. And we could also do f of 1.23, which is 0 0.056083, which is positive. So even doing better, we know c is between 1.23 and 1.22 and we could we could kind of start zeroing in on the root of this polynomial more and more and more so by trial and error we could approximate the solution as a consequence of the intermediate value theorem now in general we're not going to do this to solve equations because there's a lot of guessing and checking and there are more efficient ways like newton's method which we'll talk about later in this lecture series but that does conclude for us uh, lecture 13 about continuity. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you like this video, feel free to give it a like click. 
right? Uh, if you wanna see more videos like this, feel free to subscribe so you get updates about new math videos that'll be created in the future. If you have any questions whatsoever when you watch any of the videos in this lecture series, feel free to post them in the comments. I'm glad to answer them for you um, and try to help you uh, learn some more about mathematics. Bye everyone.